the Black Doctors Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Black Doctors Podcast. I am Stephen, your host. This episode, I'm joined once again by Dr. Nate Jones, pediatric emergency medicine physician. I am by training an anesthesiologist, specialized in critical care medicine, and a passion for medical ethics. Every week on this podcast, we try to bring you encouraging, inspiring guests. And sometimes we just chat and we share. This week, we're continuing last week's conversation. We're talking about our changing perspectives as we progressed through our personal journeys in graduate medical education, from being medical students to residents to fellows and now attendings. We share some of the struggles that we encountered along the way and a cheat code, essentially, to how you can be successful wherever you are in your journey. If you haven't listened already, go back to last week's episode. We can hear the first half of this conversation. We're going to pick up where we left off and jump into some topics that are super relevant for you wherever you are in your journey. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy this week's episode. And, and for medical students, right, because the setting boundaries or mm-hmm. trying to say no, that's that's incredibly difficult. We know the match process is getting more difficult. Mm-hmm. We, you know, they're, they're changing what's submitted. Step one is mm-hmm. pass, fail. Mm-hmm. So that's the question I get commonly is, you know, should I do research or should I not? And, and I try to explain that, yes, you should probably have some research when you're applying mm-hmm. to residencies. But there's, um, you know, from the, med- from the medical student perspective, mm-hmm. I was thinking research, yes, no, Mm -hmm. how many publications. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that perspective on what a program director will be looking at Mm -hmm. when they look at, you know, what is the research that you've done? Mm -hmm. Because you're saying just as much when you overcommit to five or six different projects. Mm -hmm. And now those are five or six relationships Mm -hmm. of, you know, your co-authors. Yeah. They're attending in there somewhere Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you have not um, performed mm-hmm. in a manner that they would be like, oh yeah, this is this person absolutely is, is fantastic. And right, maybe scaling right. back, doing one or two. Mm-hmm. And while you're writing that paper, you're focusing on that relationship right. with your um, with lead your author or yeah. whoever. With your PI, yeah. I think that's, just, that's really important. I, I think I've definitely been on research projects, particularly earlier on, that had like I had no concept of like what we're actually talking. What is the research question? What is my role in this? One yeah. of the biggest things that I've seen in intern selection committee processes, which I've seen a few of them now, but it's largely the people who get dinged the most are especially for those types of things are people who can't speak to their work. Like you should hmm. when asked when you go into an interview and someone says, Hey, Steven, I saw that you did research on like cytokine release and and COVID patients. Well, um, and you're like, yeah, it was really cool. Oh, well, what, what was your what, what what was your process? What were right. you thought about it? You're just like, well, I, my my PI told me this is really interesting. It would really be helpful to me. It's like, all right, well, no, that's not like right. And yeah. When you're going to getting into med school, I don't think it matters as much. I think when you are starting to become more of a dif- differentiated physician, uh, if you're going to like a specific specialty, then like you should be able to speak to something. And also not everything needs to be hardcore bench work research. If that's what you like to do, that's great. If you like to do more community-based stuff or advocacy approaches, like that's what I did. I mean, my background is in policy and advocacy. And so majority besides my one fellow fellows project was all advocacy based stuff or policy based stuff because that's who I am as a person. So if you want me, if I were to brand myself as Nate Jones, the physician, you're getting a black queer male physician who's interested in health policy and advocacy, particularly in underrepresented underrepresented communities. If you want this yeah. person, this block, this box to fit in your program, then, you know, pick me. But if you don't, and it's fine too, it's speed dating. I would like to not be part of a program that doesn't want me there either. <laughs> right. um, and great, you don't obviously need to, you know, touch all those identities, but you also need to be aware, what is your brand? Like, what are you building? What are you known for? Exactly. Steven's known, Stephen Bradley's known for, you know, social media extraordinaire and, <laughs> like, and, and master mentorship and <laughs> multiple platforms. And, but, but again, that's, but that's who you are and it's who you, what your brand is. And I think that is what's easier for people to, to digest. And I think it's easier for people to see if you can or cannot fit in their program. And it's not always about going to yeah. the best name program. So. And, 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 to unpack more of what you said mm-hmm. about, you know, you're in because we're heading into uh, interview season as well for, mm-hmm. for yep, yep, yep. residency mm-hmm. programs. So that is such a crucial thing that people say all the time, be able to discuss your research. Mm-hmm. But when I talk to somebody about their research, um, you know, I did this as a fellow. There was a medical student rotating mm-hmm. through the ICU mm-hmm. and 
I just ask them, like, you know, what, tell me about your research. Yeah. Cause I, I do all these kind of like cerebral tests. I'm, I'm not a very, you know, if it comes down to, if it was a good cop, bad cop, like Nate is the, the very nice person. I'm, I'm kind of an a-hole. Oh but <laughs> so warning to I'm future like, hey. mentees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Warning to, I'm not, I'm not nice. Don't let the podcast fool you. Right. And I asked this kid about his, his research mm-hmm. and you know, he starts stammering and this yeah. and that. And, and he's almost like, like he's embarrassed or, yeah. you know, I put him on the spot. Right. But then afterwards, I, I, I mean, I didn't take him aside. Like that's the cliche. I didn't take him aside. Mm-hmm. I was just like, Hey, when somebody asks you about your research, mm-hmm. this is your time. Right. You need to take two minutes, have an elevator speech. Exactly. I did this, 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 and this. Mm-hmm. Boom. Like people don't, people aren't even going to listen after, you know, they might listen. I, I don't listen after the first like 30, 40 seconds if it's not for me. Yeah. But that uh, excitement mm-hmm. that, that, that you're, you're, you're putting yourself out there, somebody that like, I, I like this, mm-hmm. I know how to do it. Yeah. And you're, you're putting out some confidence yeah. that it is palpable. It is. And, it, and, and that is the infectious part of it. That's that. that to me, that's when I really like an applicant when I ask them something and their eyes light up. It's like, oh, I did this because of what? And I'm like, oh, yeah. great. I mean, even if I'm not interested in it, I may have no concept of what you're even talking about. But at least like, I can see that you have a passion and you've done some work on yourself. And granted, there may be people who are listening right now who have done projects already and they're getting ready to apply. I'm like, oh, I did a project, which I didn't really like feel invested in. But then the other alternative is also to say, well, I did this project because... My goal was to learn the science, the research methodology. Mm-hmm. Like my goal was that I, my goal wasn't just to get published. I don't, I, was, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, but I would say that like my goal was to learn how to work on a team to develop a QI project. And, and that was my goal. I'm not particularly interested in like sepsis, but I'm very much interested in, in like learning more about different research methodologies. And I think oh, that is hurt like, my heart. I, You're not interested in sepsis. <laughs> you have <laughs> <laughs> Stuff is your go-to. I'm like, all right, just give it, everybody gets a bolus. Give them some antibiotics. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no, but but yeah, those, those things. Like, it's it's like that's the like. And again, if you know what your brand is and you know that there's, then you can look at your, like your CV and look at your stuff and say, okay, this doesn't quite fit my brand. Is should I even include this mm-hmm. in my application? And if I am then this most likely will be highlighted in some way. So be able to speak to every single part of your application um, because you'll be surprised yeah. what people, I mean, I don't do intern um, selection stuff anymore just because I, it's so hard. Those, getting through those interviews are so hard. But even now when I, when I like advise people when they're, when they're applying for certain things, it's like, let me see what your personal statement is. It's like are, are, what you're speaking to in your personal statement reflective in your CV is reflective in like the mentor, the letters of recommendation people you ask. I mean, letters of recommendation you ask to be written for you. Like, do those all are they all a cohesive package? And for some yeah. people it works, some people don't. And you know, other people I I specifically for black or other um trainees of color, like it is so, so, so key to have your own brand first because people will put you in to their idea of what you're doing. And yeah, if you're not a person who works on health equity, okay, that's great. That's not not every brown and black person easy works on health equity. Exactly. <laughs> like is that yeah. like you maybe like I literally just like want to learn about like sepsis and I just want to do work on sepsis work in the ICO. Cool. But then it's fine. It, so yeah, because my when I was I mean I, I was applying for jobs last year. Uh-huh. I don't have DEI on my CV. Mm-hmm. I'm not a DEI expert. There's so many people I, I look to people like yourself mm-hmm. and um, Italo Brown mm-hmm. and and Adam Milam and and Manny Calhoun. There's so many people that actually do DEI work, mm-hmm. and I learned from them. Mm-hmm. But I'm not your DEI consultant. Right. So it was interesting as I'm interviewing to see when and if. DEI got brought up yes. because that's not that's not what I'm here for. I do right. medical ethics, right? Right. Um, you are an that's ethicist. my brand. You are an ethicist. Yes. I, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I guess <laughs> I, I got to work on my brand. But it, it was interesting to see, you know, when did that that get brought up? And I didn't start that conversation. Mm-hmm. So you've already pigeonholed me to be your DEI person. Right. Um, so that it was a kind of interesting thing. Uh, you mentioned CVs, and mm-hmm. and I, I would say, I when I do like a mock interview yeah. or help people with their personal thing. I, I'm going to ask you for a CV. If you're looking for mentorship mm-hmm. and you cold email somebody mm-hmm. that by that second email, you should probably be sending over a CV mm-hmm. personal statement to somebody. Cause I don't know you. Right. right if you just email right. me, I'm going to look through that CV and it's going to be, I don't know. Some people have long CVs or some just a page. Yeah. It's a lot of words. Yeah. I'm very, I get bored easily. Mm-hmm. I'm going to find a couple of those research papers or something that's interesting. Mm-hmm. You led, the Sewing Circle Club in Middletown, Ohio, or something. Mm-hmm. And I want to ask you about that because that's what's interesting. And I yeah. think that's a lot what a lot of program directors are doing because they're getting thousands and thousands of applicants. Right. Or, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, a lot of applicants, mm-hmm. a lot of CVs. Mm-hmm. So being able to talk about 
the things that you enjoy or yes. what's actually on your CV mm -hmm. is is huge. Yeah. Is it, nobody likes dead space in an interview. No, the quiet space of staring off and just like, I mean, luckily, I, I, I talk a lot and baseline and talk really fast. So I'm able to cover a lot in a 30 minute interview. <laughs> so I feel like people who interview me are exhausted <laughs> afterwards. Like, Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> but it's it just actually what you say is very true. When I used to do um, interviews for intern selection, I actually would not look at a lot of the application stuff prior to i would probably look at it maybe 30 minutes before the interview largely because yeah. i can't read through all that b <laughs> the other other thing is that like <laughs> if i can look through your stuff in like 10 minutes and get a gist of who you are you did a really good job putting yourself together mm -hmm. um if i can't then then i know what questions need to ask to figure out what you are and what you're looking for because my biggest thing is like i am not here to tell you if you're a good applicant or not i'm i'm here to sort of help the program to figure out if you are an ideal applicant for their culture and for their space. Like, I feel like that's a very different space to be like, you're great because you have, you know, well, we don't have step scores anymore, but you have a really high step one score or something. Or more so like, no, you, you're really interested in like this type of stuff. And this institution is not really known for it. Could it grow in that way? Sure. But maybe this is not the right place for you. I don't say that. I've never said that on yeah. interview before. But like those are those type of questions I try to do. So when I write the comments to refer to the committee, it's more so like, oh, this is what this person talked about. This is what I struggled with. And every single selection committee, at least in books I've done, has been more so like at the end of the, it's like, can you have a conversation with this person? Are they a real person? And there would be where like, I cannot have a conversation with you. I don't know how you're going to be in the patient room. I cannot imagine you seeing patients. Right. But it's what it is. They landed somewhere. <laughs> we'll see where they go. Yeah. And there's, there's obviously a lot of bias and mm -hmm. other conversations that we can have about all of that, which I'm sure we'll get to at some other right. uh, episode. But mm -hmm. we were really going to talk about transition. Oh, yeah, this we got off topic. See, the lovely ADHD. Um, of <laughs> <laughs> I think we both, we both have yeah. it. Uh, but that, I'm sure, I mean, that is very timely because right. a lot of people are, are are there and some people are on the interview mm -hmm. committees and whatnot. Uh, with what time we have left, like, I wonder if we can go through and say what um, you thought at each stage, like what was a, an, an idea you had as a medical student that you realize is false or, or different now that you can see it kind of in mm. in the uh, in perspective? Oh wow, that's a deep question, and I have to go way back, back I ten can, years. I, I can start with yeah, you go first. You, yeah, go. okay. So <laughs> I remember when I was a medical student, uh -huh. my relationship with the attendings, there was this uh, patriarchal, mm -hmm. matriarchal, mm -hmm. um, like they know everything. Mm -hmm. They care so much about the things that I do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right or wrong. They're waiting to just like lay the hammer on me or or they hold my life in, in their hands. And and what I realized was on the back end, attending physicians, especially in academic medicine, often have so many things going on mm -hmm. between the metrics that they have mm -hmm. to do, the clinically, the mm -hmm. work they have to do. The supervision, right? You're you're providing medicine while supervising yes. resident physicians. Yes. And then you have medical students mm -hmm. that are running around. And you're gonna your job is to teach them, right? That's why you went into academics. Mm -hmm. And there is a range with who wants to teach and how much. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, everybody's everybody's different. Yeah. So I think I had this uh this self-centered or uh was it heliocentric? I don't know, this worldview that mm -hmm. it was all about me mm -hmm. and everybody's staring at me and waiting. And it's really like now, I mean, when medical students Come, I'm like, oh, great, you're here. Let me teach you some right, things, and, right? Yeah, and we can help you do stuff. Mm -hmm. And and but I'm not like, I don't go home and perseverate over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I don't think about you like as soon as you, you know, I'm probably going to send you home out the OR early. <laughs> to be honest, right, but yeah. uh, that that's something that's changed for me from medical student to mm. attending. It's very because that's very similar to like learning that your parents are like infallible or like <laughs> just like one of those things. You're just like. I used to think the attendings would know everything. And then now you're attending it. Like, yeah, I, I know how to do a decent amount of things, but I strongly, because I'm, I think, I think in medicine is mainly about what your reasoning is and your judgment levels are and like how, yeah. and you can make better judgment calls based off your experience, which is why we go through so much, so many years of training and see so many patients. And then you pace that with medical knowledge, which is helpful. But yeah, when I was a medical student, I really thought similar to you, I really thought that like, I had to be on like my, because I did not want to hurt anyone. I didn't want to mess something up. One of the things that I, that kind of hurt me earlier on in my training was that I was so afraid. I was so aware of my imposter syndrome and I was so afraid mm. of making mistakes or people knowing what yeah. I didn't know. Like I didn't, wasn't that strong in like, you know, virology or something. And I'd be on the internal medicine service and they're talking about like different like sodiums and equations. And I'm like, oh, I don't care about this. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, try to hide, I try to hide that. But 
I didn't ask questions. I never, I never, like, earlier, mm. I didn't start asking questions when I was a fellow. Like, I literally, I remember I, for, like, I didn't, I didn't actually hear a residency because I went through grad school at the same time. And for four years of residency and, and, and those two years of med school, so six years, I just passively accepted information. Like, I was like, okay, cool. Yep. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And then my, and I wasn't toward like the end of residency where I was like, why do we do it this way? And like, or someone would ask, it's not until you start teaching too, is when you start to really realize there's certain gaps in your knowledge yeah. that you didn't realize. Um, or I would do, I'd be in the ED and I'm like, oh, I can't think of anything else this could be. Like I have my differentials, like two things. And I'm like, what? How do, how is this possible? And then I realized, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't do inventory of what I know. I don't do like, I need to know more about like this thing. And I think I was also very afraid of asking the dumb question, being on rounds and being like, well, right. why did you do this? Yeah. Um, or being the one who's slowing the team down or something like that. And so what I learned through the process, even now as an attending, I ask questions all the time from consultants and things because I don't know everything. And I, and I learned yeah. more in the last, like my three years of fellowship um, and my now two years of attending hood than I've, I've learned in the past like six years or so previously in residency and medical school, but largely because I ask questions about things I don't know. And I'm very much more aware of what I don't know. Um, and I feel like people get into trouble are those who don't ask those questions the scariest residents I've seen or scariest trainees I've seen are those who are uh, <laughs> super efficient, but don't have any medical right. knowledge. Like, it's just like, oh, you're just you're you're getting by because you're able to look, work the system very well. But you actually don't know why we do X, Y, Z. And that's a problem, because once you leave this institution to go somewhere else, you're not going to be efficient anymore. So you need to know what, what is right and what is wrong. And every institution is different. So for yeah, that's good. Yeah. Asking because you're, you're right. Um that fear of I'm going to ask a dumb question yeah. and people always say like, Oh, there's no such thing as a dumb question or people say, Oh, you're paying for your education. So, but it's true in medical school, you're paying yeah. to learn. Yeah. So if you don't understand something and, and part of it is how you ask the question, like, you know, if you're asking, um, what's a normal hemoglobin? Right. But it's, you know, uh, and sometimes it, it's a bit of, a little bit of showmanship, right? Mm-hmm. You, you Google it real quick, and you have a very educated question right. to ask, because you also want to know why your resident did this, mm-hmm. the why behind mm-hmm. this. Because, like you mentioned, once you get out at another facility, you just say, "Oh, we did it this way at my old place." Well, why? What's the evidence behind it? Okay, right. Nice. I, I think um, moving to residency. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said this before in a previous episode, evaluations. So when I went in, I did not know how many people had their eyes on you. Mm-hmm. And it's not across the board, right? Yeah. I'm sure there's a uh, racial bias mm-hmm. depending on who you're working with. But the way programs are set up, there's clinical competency committees and every you know couple months by ACGME requirements, whatever, they mm-hmm. have to review their residents and their, their fellows, et cetera. And having been on the other side, right, as an attending uh, with a residency program, mm-hmm. there's, depending on the size of your residence, residency program, there's there's not enough time to focus on everything. So mm-hmm. if you're doing good, you're okay, you have your one piece of research, mm-hmm. you're not getting in fights with patients and nurses, you're in the correct percentile right. on your entry and exam, yeah. you're good. But once you get... A, a black mark or something bad happens, all of a sudden, you, boom, you know, your name, your picture is going to be up on that board mm-hmm. and you go into the radar. Yeah. And there's a, there's a chance to crawl your way out of that hole, but oh, strike two. Yeah. Now you're a problem, uh, a problem student, resident. Yeah. Problem resident. Mm-hmm. And once you get that label, oh my God, like it is so hard to, to get rid of that. Mm-hmm. Um, fortunately, I found out very early in, in residency, but people keep lists, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's it's what they what they do mm-hmm. with your evaluations, and that can be used to to help you or to hurt you, mm-hmm. um, depending on what's what what's going on. Yeah, that's, and that's unfortunately true. I mean, we don't in pediatrics. It's not as like at least in, in the programs I've been a part of. At least it's not been as caught or cutthroat like that. But um, it is well known those who struggle and people struggle mm-hmm. for different reasons, right? And I think this when it comes to like tra- mentorship and transparency. Because you can be struggling with something personal. Like I do know colleagues of mine or even I've had um, students or trainees that come up to me and um, and like, I feel like, what the hell? Like, why are you not doing And I'm like, and they're like, oh, for the past few months I've been dealing with it. And I'm like, okay. Like that puts things in context, right? Yeah. But I don't, th- but this goes back to what we said earlier is that like, unless you feel the courage to be able to speak like that on your own, to be able to say like, hey, I've been dealing with like a death in the family or I have my own like, you know, mental health issues that I'm working on or then it's then then it's hard, right? Because in medicine, you're not allowed to be 
in a human being. You're not allowed to have problems. You're not allowed to have things outside of medicine affect your ability to do the job. Right. And it's it's hard, but but then that goes on your on your on your evaluations. And if you're particularly a trainee of color, like we know there's racial bias that goes into play with these things. We do know that, you know, trainees of color will get lower scores um, for perceived, you know, inadequacies, which you know their white counterparts would not get lower scores on. And I wish I wish that was like I wish it wasn't the case, but hopefully this will change for a lot of ways. Um <laughs> Speaking on that, to me, I think I remember when I was in residency, I was so afraid of that. Like I was so afraid of what I was going to be labeled as like, because I mean, I didn't come from a school that like put a lot of emphasis on pediatrics and I didn't put mm, emphasis on pediatrics yeah. till the end of my third year because I was like, I'm not going to go to oh. pediatrics in my almost last <laughs> rotation. I was like, I ain't doing this. Like, yes. And I didn't. It was amazing. And then I didn't have like I did my sub-I and then I was like, all right, well, that's all I know about pediatrics. <laughs> so, um, so to be a pediatric resident. It was hard. I, I mean, I was dealing with people, and, and you're still very competitive in med school. Like that mindset's still inside of you. You're just, I have to be the best, gotta be the best. And eventually, that goes away because people are tired and no one cares anymore. But like, what I what I was so afraid of was I was going to be one of those problem residents. I was going to be the one who didn't know anything, or I was going to have to go to the program director's office and talk about things and come a remediation program or something. And I remember I was talking to one of my one of my friends, and I remember being like, I just need to know where I stand. I just need to know where my feedback is. What are my scores? What do I need to do? And I remember him going like, why does it matter? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. And I was like, I'm so afraid that I'm not doing well. And because I don't get a grade every month or I don't get, you know, evaluations every two weeks to tell me what I did on this rotation, I don't know if I'm doing well. I don't know if I'm doing this right. Hmm. Is this how you become a doctor? You just keep doing things and learn? I don't know. And then this goes back to the idea that, like, in the end, it doesn't really matter. If you are struggling, though, there are definitely ways of resources to, like, help you get through that. And it really does apply on a really good mentorship program, a really good mentorship structure and a really amazing program director to help you get through this. But yeah, I, I was so obsessed with the idea of like being not the best. I didn't want to be like the Christina Yang of the program, but I didn't want to be like, you know, you know, hurting people or getting things wrong or being dumb. And that stunted my ability to learn because I was so afraid of being wrong. So I would, my advice would be, honestly, if you feel my untold anxiety about being wrong about something, it's super helpful to just sit down with your attending and be like, hey, can I get some feedback? I never ask for feedback. Mm, never yes. ask for feedback yeah. ever. Yeah. Then when residents ask me for feedback, I'm just like, what, what do you need? What do you need? Like, don't you get evaluations? And I'm like, oh, yeah. Like, it's a newer thing to, like, actually get feedback in real time. It's like, hey, how did the rounds go? All right, hey, I did that procedure. And, like, did that go well? How can I do this better? And we are trained as attendings, or you should be trained as attendings to how to, how to give f- appropriate feedback. So, but I would say my advice is ask for feedback in real time if you feel like you're struggling. Mm-hmm. Because the earlier you realize that like your issues are real issues, like people are perceiving this means that you are perceiving, then you can address it. But if it's in your head that you're like, I'm doing terrible and everyone's like, no, you're fine. You don't get your evaluation until six months. You spend six months thinking you're doing terrible, which you probably were doing quite well. Yeah, and, and conversely, mm-hmm. you could be doing well mm-hmm. and you could have... A hater or two that's out there <laughs> yes, and that is just dragging your name oh. to the mud. So you figure that out early. Now you can go to your mentor right. and you can squat up and you have something to, to combat those mis uh, you know, those those uh misperceptions. Right. I remember there was one I'll share the story really quickly because I know we're gonna be short on time, but I there was one time where I was actually gonna quit residency and this was my second year of residency, I think, yeah. So my program, I did grad school. I said before I did grad school and residency at the same time, like a crazy person. And <laughs> I don't know how you did that. That was, that was insane. Um, so <laughs> I would, and at UChicago, they're in quarter systems. So I would do a quarter um, in grad school and that, and then I would be away from clinical activities and I would come back and do clinical stuff. Um, and I'll never forget my first time I was away. I was gone for, for three months. I had not been in the hospital for three months and I just started Oof. learning this stuff. And my first rotation back was in the ICU. And I struggled so much because ICU medicine, as you know, Mr. ICU here, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's not easy. It's very detail oriented. I mean, I, I'm prone with ADHD. I'm not good with details. Um, I've never experienced this type of medicine before. And I had an attending who like literally hated my spectacle. Oh, gosh. It was the most, and I, I mean, when I tell you like, she would like not let me put in orders in by myself. She would like stand over my corner, I mean, over my shoulder. She like wouldn't make comments about my presentations. Like I felt so insecure as a provider 
And I was working like 36 hour days and being exhausted and being told I don't know anything. I don't, I'm not doing anything right. I, um, I ain't working 36 hour days. Well, we have, you have, you have like on call and then you round. It's like, what was that 36 hours? What was that? 12, 24, 24, sorry, 24. Sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing the old, the old, like, you were uh, down uncle, bed. Oh, the old school. Yeah. Like back yeah. in my day, I worked 48 hours. Around. Like, no, I, was, I forgot. I forgot about ACJV rules. <laughs> uh, recall bias. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, I remember there was, it was right before Christmas. Yeah. There was, it was right for Christmas. My birthday is around mm. Christmas. The first time I missed Christmas yep. at home, my mom mailed me all my Christmas gifts. And I was opening them after I was post-call by myself in my living room. And that was after I got reamed about, like, this asthmatic who, like, we weaned and, like, needed to go back on continue. It was something stupid. I was like, now was intending. That's really ridiculous to worry about. <laughs> and and I remember just, like, like, crying and just being like, I can't do this. Like, this isn't meant for me. I- I'm not in a space where, like, I'm going to be told I'm terrible every single day. And I don't even have a support system. I'm not near my family. I'm not near anyone I know. And I was like, I think I'm just going to email my program director and just say I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I literally would drive an email. I was like, I'm just not, I can't, I can't do this. And it was largely because it's just like, you, I don't know what her issue was, what that attending issue was. Um, and it's funny because I came back as a third year and I'm like, you're amazing. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm not freaking depressed and I know what the hell I'm doing. Like, Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm a trainee. <laughs> give me a second. Jesus Christ. I can do it. Just give me a second. Damn. Um, but, like, that speaks to volumes. Like, if there's someone who's after you, if there's an attending that's after you, like, I wish I would have went to my program director earlier and been like, yo, this is not fair. Like, give me a second. I'm not bad. I'm great. But, like, I, need a, I mean, I need someone to talk to this attending. And if I had, I didn't have any mentors at that time. Had I had a mentor, I would have went directly to them and been like, hey, can you help me? I'm, I've done that for my, yeah. for my mentees. I've spoken directly to attendings about about the way they treated some of my, my, my mentees because it's yep. not fair. Absolutely. And I don't think, I don't think trainees should have to speak for themselves by themselves all the time. Um, yeah. I would, I, I would have reached out earlier on cause my program director is phenomenal and I would have reached out earlier on and just said, Hey, like, this is like kind of unfair. Like, I don't think I'm doing wrong. And actually one, uh, we have one of our, one of our friends in common. She, she was one of my senior resident and I told her the story like, uh, few years later and she was like yeah you did fine i didn't even notice you were struggling and i was like i know but it was like sh-. right like it's like it's like again it's a lot of it's in your head but it's not all in your head like Living rent free rent free in your head. right right so get that feedback get it get it earlier and then like also if you feel like you're being attacked or hounded by an attending you should not be as a trainee and mm-hmm. you definitely need to figure out get your allies and, and get it together so wait wait a minute oh no. me, you're glitching your, your new studios it's glitching oh i think my uh oh my phone died you're on your phone? <laughs> no, nah, that's the that's the camera. It's fine. I think it's still uh, it's still recording audio. Okay, okay. Um, no, that that is here. And, and at the very least, if something happens, you can reach out. Text. Yeah. I don't know. Text me on Instagram or something. Be like, hey, does this sound right? Right. And if it sounds crazy, I'm gonna be like, uh, yeah, you should talk to somebody you right. trust in your program. Right. Mm-hmm. Just just throw it off some some sounding board. You right. know. So. Um, as we start to wrap up, I'll probably combine yeah. what I've learned as a fellow mm-hmm. and attending because I had a very circuitous route, right? I practiced mm-hmm. and then came back to fellowship. And and that is the role of um, leadership. Mm-hmm. As a fellow, as an attending, you, that's when you're going to start to learn how to give feedback, mm-hmm. how to teach. And something that because of some of the, the experiences that we talked about, I've been very sensitive to is seeing how people accept feedback and correction. Mm-hmm. I think that's something that previous generations did poorly, right? Mm-hmm. We had the gruff surgeon that's, you know, mean and, and they just you you live up to their high expectations and that's just them all the time. Mm-hmm. Then you have the sweet pediatrician, I'm doing all the tropes, I guess, <laughs> the sweet pediatrician that's like always nice but then they might give you a, a, a shady uh, eval, mm, but they never talk to aggressive. you to your face. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there is that some people that just can't change who they are mm-hmm. and how they teach based upon how it's being received. Mm-hmm. So I've gone out of my way as a fellow, as an attending to see, like as I'm talking to this uh, trainee, mm-hmm. and, they're not, you know, doing well in the ICU. What's going on? Oh, Nate. Oh, man. Oh, you were out of the out of the clinical space for three months. Mm-hmm. Okay, I expect you to do better, mm-hmm. but I understand. Mm-hmm. And now we can work together for a common goal. Right, right, right. Um, so that is what that's something that I've been able to do and meet residents where they they are. I had some people that struggled very poorly in ICU. Mm-hmm. ICU was tough. It's hard. And instead of browbeating them or saying mm-hmm. you should know this because you're at the end of your PGY one year, right, or whatever, right. it's, Hey, you know, 
let's sit down, let's work on your presentations. Mm. And and should I be doing this for this person at this level of their training? Mm. They're, yeah, they're kind of behind their peers. They're actually really bad. Mm. But you know what? You, I'm going to be there to support you. Right. And whatever happens between you and your program, that's that's on them. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to be the best mentor and um, fellow or, or attending mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for you in this time. And and I don't know that that's me. Not everybody is you know can be teacher of the the year mm-hmm. like I was. Um, uh, were you teacher of the year? year? But and uh, yeah, my last year uh, with the residents in the, in the Navy. As yes, mean as you are. Oh my God! See, this is bu- <laughs> this is a bull. <laughs> Stockholm Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> you just traumatize everyone and they just go award you. This is crazy. This is medicine at its finest. This is <laughs> what? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Oh, shocker, shocker. Okay, cool. <laughs> oh, man. No, that's true. That's true. I, I, I think uh, I, I, it always also breaks my heart, too, when I see a trainee of color, like, really sh- struggle with certain things. Not because I feel like they're inefficient, but I know what I was like to look like that and what's going on in my head. And I, that's why I have a lot of compassion and sort of just being like, and not a like, bro, do it together. You're like representing all of us type of thing. It was more so just like, right. no, I, I just struggle to live in this space and to work in this space that's not meant for us to really work in or to be in. It's com- it compounds the factor that like you're also learning something new. Um, and so there has to be a level of compassion, a level of grace that's given. And also like there are so many things that like, my attendees could have made easier for me that like I try to do all the time. I'm like, yo, like this is what I expect. Expectations are huge. Like, right. Like, exactly. This is what I need. Like when I tell residents like, hey, I have a, an attention span of a goldfish. Like, please don't do a full on like five minute presentations. <laughs> I can't listen to that the entire time. It's the ER. <laughs> Give me your assessment. Give me your plan. Let's move forward. Like those are those those types of things. And sometimes, you know, residents can do it, and sometimes they can't. And then I always say, hey, this this is what I want you to aim for. You're not going to meet all these things. That's okay too. Yeah. But yeah, I'm always good cop. I'm not really like you're an idiot because you didn't know how to like suture this last iteration. Like not once. None of that's none of that's that big of a deal. We're all here to learn. And, and the thing is, if you didn't care, mm-hmm. you wouldn't give feedback. Yes. You would just let them keep doing whatever it is that that they're doing. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, I think what, cause when I look back, when I reflected on my time in residency, mm-hmm. I had some attendings that I didn't particularly like their approach, mm-hmm. but I will say they were very invested in my success. And so that's the thing I tried to model. Like right. I'm, I'm not the type to be your friend, mm-hmm. but I am here to educate you to the best of my ability. And I think that that shines when, like when you mm-hmm. tell them your expectations, like then they can, they can now meet. They don't have to guess what your expectations are. Right. Yeah. It's very much um, easier that way. Yeah. So I'm glad so, we're, well, I guess we're both in academics still. Yeah. And um, we can help uh, change the culture. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think there's so many tips that we can give in terms of thinking about like from an attending perspective and what could be done better for trainees. I mean, it's always about, I mean, this podcast is really for, I know, I know it's the Black Doctors podcast, but it's really for all trainees of color, <laughs> um, regardless yeah. of the color. Um but it, it it really is particularly about like you know how, like it's a different you're we're a different population we've gone through different things and the system is not made for us so how do we live how do we grow how do we feed ourselves in this in this you know system that we're in so and if we can help you navigate that system please uh, let us know mm-hmm. we're always open to feedback usually on um, I think the Instagram page is the easiest place to get a hold of us mm-hmm. at the Black Earth Podcast. Not on Twitter. Who knows if Twitter, how much longer Twitter is going to be around for? I know, threads versus Twitter. I don't have a threads because I, I, I barely use Twitter. So I'm like, I don't really need another thing. But yeah. You, yeah. you know, I got a threads account. But I, I, You probably were well, number one of the beta. Were you on the beta? <laughs> <laughs> were you on that? Was that your I'm thing? on there. I I can't figure out how to work it. So no. I don't know. We'll we'll see. But we're we're here. Um, we're, we're back. The Black Tartars Podcast. Mm. Uh, thank you for joining us for this episode. I, I know... I'll, we covered a lot of territory. Mm-hmm. I think it was all very helpful depending on where you are in your career. We just want you to be the best mm-hmm. uh, healthcare worker, whatever type you are yeah. that you possibly can be. Nate Jones, thanks for uh, coming back I'm on the back. show. Or, or, um, from your uh, hiatus, you my sabbatical. sabbatical. I had a little bit of a sabbatical. Yeah. I got to get my life together because it was a bit of a... To Beyonce, a sabbatical. Of, to, uh, listen, I had a bit of a renaissance and it feels good to be, to be the the newer version of myself. <laughs> yes, refreshed and ready to share. Ready to go. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us on this week's episode of the Black Doctors Podcast. We're here because representation matters. Yeah, I'll try to use the term. Did I use the term provider in this conversation? I feel like you you, put, you would have edited it out if I did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's fine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit it. I'm going to AI voice your position. <laughs> like, this is what Nate really meant to say. I'm like, who is this person? <laughs> 
my AI counterpart. 